Welcome, everybody. This is How to English Teach and Learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal, and references will be given when necessary. M, today we're going to discuss the topic of native speakerism. So, first things first, Gav, explain what a native English speaker is. Well, M, thoughtco.com describes a native English speaker as someone who is born in the UK, North America, Australia, or New Zealand, and whose mother tongue is English. Really? That seems like a very short list. I'm sure there are more than that. Yeah. What about all of the other countries where English is an official language? Wikipedia lists loads of countries that aren't mentioned. If we just pick Africa, Botswana, Cameroon, Eswatini, Gambia, Ghana, Kenya, and that's just some of the countries where English is an official language. Absolutely. There's India, Trinidad, Tobago, Fiji... Papua New Guinea. The list is very extensive, Gav, but it seems like in the EFL world, people only seem to be interested in the UK, America, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. It's very odd. But even if that limited list you've just mentioned were true, why is it important to define native in the EFL world at all? And what is native speakerism? According to teachingrevolution.com, there is a lack of consensus as to how to properly define this phenomenon. But generally speaking, it refers to the widespread misconception that native speakers of a language are inherently more capable of teaching that language than non-native speakers of that language, regardless of professional qualifications, experience, past results or scientific studies. So in a nutshell, this definition means that people born in a particular country appear to be more qualified to teach than other people who may not have been born in that country. That's what it suggests to us, M. There are so many troubling aspects to native English speaker, and I think I'm left with more questions and answers from those definitions, Gav. I personally avoid the term native or non-native when describing teachers or myself. I might describe teachers based on their teaching qualification. For example, they have a BA in linguistics or a CELTA, or maybe talk about where the teacher is from, but only if it's relevant to the conversation. Otherwise, I don't mention it. Neither do I, M. For more general and academic definitions and discussions on native speakerism, we'd recommend, if you haven't already, to read up on the topic. We'll put some links in the show notes and also consider doing your own research. Also, don't forget our previous episode on the topic of money matters, where we touched on this subject. That was Season 1's Episode 37 featuring Zdenek, where we discussed how teachers are sometimes treated differently depending on their background and how teachers' chances of getting employment with some companies could be affected by what's written on the teacher's CV or resume. If you say you're born in a, quote, native English-speaking country, you might be offered higher wages. So native English-speaking country doesn't seem very logical. For example, in the USA, there are around 40 million Spanish speakers. And in the UK, there are many speakers of Polish, Romanian, Punjabi and other languages. Coming from an English-speaking country doesn't tell us anything about an individual's ability to use or teach a language, which must be relevant to this conversation, surely. Yeah, saying you're from a native English-speaking country leaves a lot of ambiguity, M. I think this is a good time to introduce today's guest, who is Mary, also known as the non-native speaker. You can find her on Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. We'll put her links in the show notes. We were so inspired by Mary that we asked her to give us some of her thoughts on native speakerism for today's show. We want to share this with our followers because we feel this is a really important topic which needs to be discussed in depth and frequently. We've broken up Mary's recording into parts so we can really digest the significance of the issues she raises. Let's listen to Mary's introduction and find out a bit about her. 
I'd like to thank Gavin M for inviting me to record this uh, podcast for them on the topic of native speakerism. I am the non-native speaker. You can find me on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on all the social media platforms. And I normally talk about the dis- discriminatory practices that are reserved for non-native English language teachers, the disadvantages that we have over our native speaker counterparts who um, have taken a lot of benefits from simply being born in the right place or having the right nationality or passport. I've grown to become aware of native speakerism um, well into my adulthood. I studied English at the age of eight in an international school in Malaysia. My family moved around a lot, so I learned uh, four different languages by the age of 13. And I would say that I'm, I am proficient as of today in two languages as I speak them interchangeably without any, um, any hardship, <laughs> let's put it this way. So um, when I went, after my CELTA and DELTA formation courses and after I had achieved uh, um, a master's degree in languages, I really thought that that was what was missing to advance in my career as an English language teacher. However, I realized that a lot of uh, organizations and private language schools would not accept my application simply because I was and am on paper and in fact Armenian and I have a foreign name. Thank you, Mary. As you said, you got a certain level of proficiency with your qualifications and certificates and felt that that should be sufficient to be recognised as a fully qualified language teacher. Can you imagine, Gav, doing all that training and then not getting a job based on something like your name? And on the other side, my own personal experience, I've worked with people with absolutely no qualifications who came from the UK and could walk into a classroom and teach a group of people just because of where they're from. Yeah, there's definitely something wrong with that, Now let's return to Mary. So I realized that, you know, um, a lot of native speakers instead who were not specifically teachers were taking advantage and they were talking about a biological advantage for having lived for their entire lives in a monolingual society where they had practiced English and therefore were better at speaking English and teaching English for that. So... To combat this ideology, obviously, there are different ways and different conversations that need to be had. Obviously, you know, speakerhood and race are socially constructed traits. And so we must be very well aware that you are not born into an occupation, but you study for an occupation. So this would be a bit like getting a job as a doctor because you've got a parent as a doctor. Where else does that happen in any other industry? I can't think of another example of a profession where that would be acceptable, Em. Mm, It's a weird open-door policy just because of your passport. And English teachers from the US, the UK, Australia and New Zealand benefit from, as Mary said, a perceived biological advantage by living in a monolingual society. But as we explained in the introduction, it doesn't tell you anything about that person's background, about their capacity to teach the language... I think Mary said it best, quote, you're not born into an occupation, but you study for it. Let's hear from Mary again. Second, it is really important that we don't give English language teachers a bad name, simply because most of the English language teachers that are hired here in Italy, for instance, are hired just because they're mother tongue speakers or um, native speakers. And most um, certifications or descriptors that come from uh, proficiency tests, in their descriptors themselves, um, they evaluate someone's knowledge. And the, the highest point for any speaker would be that of reaching a native speaker level. Obviously, if we use our critical thinking, we realize that not all native speakers have the same level of English. However, Native speakers or people who are conceived as, you know, native speakers 
have that advantage of not having to go through proficiency tests because they can self-assess themselves as being native speakers and therefore they don't have to go through a testing system to prove uh, their knowledge of the English language. This makes it unequal because non-native English speaking teachers, even if they're qualified, like I am, even though I have a master's uh, degree in languages, even though I have a Celta Cambridge and a Delta Cambridge and I have 14 years of experience, sometimes we need to take a proficiency test to test, to get a C2 level across all skills, reading, listening, speaking and writing, and sometimes our interactive skills and communicative skills. These tests are costly and they take time and effort to prepare because uh, most of them are not real life based and we have to really prepare and study for them. I have taught English for many years and I've had to prepare these tests myself and it doesn't come instinctively to get the best scores as you do them. But I always wondered why it is and how my fellow native colleagues would would have done had they taken the test themselves and proven their worth since all they had to do was tick a box on their application and state that they were born in so-and-so place. Mother tongue English speakers have the advantage of claiming their level is proficient native and often don't have to be tested, which doesn't seem fair, in my opinion. As Mary said, just ticking that box is sufficient for many companies, I guess. Definitely. Em, tell us about your experiences. Did you simply tick a box and walk in the door and begin teaching? I can say yes and no. I've had experiences where that has been enough. I think just what I look like, how I sound, got me the job. I didn't need to do any test. I didn't need to show any lesson plans. I was just given a class and that was it. But then I have also had experiences where I've worked for companies that needed me to do a grammar test, provide a lesson plan, explain my lesson plan in an interview, demo the lesson. So there's been a real mix for me, but I've definitely experienced what Mary's talking about, where I think I've got the job based just on where I was from. I can honestly say that has happened. I think that is exactly the same for me. And having a photo on your CV or place of birth, things like that can be advantageous to some people and a definite disadvantage to others, which seems really, really unfair. Absolutely, Gav. And I think we're going to come back to this later, what we can actually do to change this situation. So stick with us, everyone. We're going to try and find some ways of dealing with this. Let's listen to the last part of Mary's recording. So in a six minute talk, this is as much as I can fit in. There is a lot to discuss how biased it is, the industry of English language teaching, how it is detrimental to the teaching profession that anyone can, you know, with the right passport and nationality, enter the job. There are many conversations that need to be had to prevent this. And many conversations are happening at the moment around this topic. We are being more open to a variety of accents in our textbooks. However, we also need to realize that we need a diverse array of teachers who are qualified to teach in our schools. We need to combat uh, this ideology that um, native speakers are the best teachers out there. The best teacher is a qualified one. And like with any profession, you need to have a degree to enter the profession at all. Thank you for listening. As Mary said, native speakerism is detrimental to the teaching profession. But fortunately... Conversations are happening and we're seeing in our course books, we're hearing a variety of accents, but still we need to expand the diversity within our teaching teams, combat the idea that native teachers only require the basic qualifications. We agree with Mary that the best teacher is a qualified one. Thank you again to Mary. Don't forget to check out her Instagram at the underscore non underscore native underscore speaker and her youtube on mary's website she's currently offering monthly cpd sessions cpd m 
continuous professional development training for English language teachers from multilingual backgrounds. So check that out. I think we need to put this topic into practical situations, Gav, and look at some solutions. We've got some questions that we might get from our students. I think we need to discuss it and work out how to deal with them and also think about the language we're using. Gav, what would you say if one of your students says, oh, I only want a native teacher? I would ask them, what do they mean by a native teacher? They usually say somebody from the UK or America. Ah, just somebody, anybody, doesn't matter who it is. <laughs> That's a good I'll reply. I'll say, hold on, I'll go and get my dad. <laughs> that is a good reply. I like the way you're dealing with that. So highlight just anybody. No, if you get someone walking in off the street, they're not going to be able to teach you, are they? So I think that's a nice, light-hearted way of dealing with it. And if you want to listen to people off the street, as you said, Em, check out YouTube. There's loads of interviews with people, those pop quiz chat interviews that could be really fun to share with your students and listen to, quotation marks, real English from around the world. Absolutely. But maybe the student is very interested in Sheffield in the UK. That's niche, Gav. Very niche. And you say to the student, sure, I can see why you're so interested in this beautiful city in the UK. But do you really need a teacher that comes from this very specific place? I don't know. Maybe. Why not? But then that's not a native teacher. That's somebody who lived or knows a lot about the city of Sheffield. It's a good example. So you're saying if you want a teacher from one very specific place, it's quite hard to find someone who knows everything about that place. And you don't need to. You can find out from anywhere, internet, about that. But just because you were born there doesn't mean that you know everything about that place. For example, Em, my students often know more about Britain than I do. That is also true. Absolutely. So even from a cultural perspective, just because they were born there, it doesn't mean that person knows everything or knows what you want them to know. So it is very strange to say you only want a teacher from one specific place. Students, listen to Teacher M. It's strange. Maybe you've seen lots of adverts and you saw native English teachers work here, teach here, they're the best. Well, don't believe what you see in advertising. Qualifications are more important. Here, here. What if your student says, how can I understand native speakers? Again, this is another fuzzy one, Gav. So do you mean fast speakers? Do you mean people who speak in a very connected way? Do you mean people who use a lot of idioms? Do you mean people who like certain dialects? Again, this doesn't mean you're from a particular place. This could just be the way you learn how to speak English. It could be the teacher you had. There is no fundamental place where people are from where they all speak the same way. doesn't exist. Get that into your head. It's not real. Like, the UK is not a place full of people with bowler hats walking around in the rain with umbrellas. It's just not like that. It's a mixed up bag of... Of languages and cultures and everything. So you can help your students to understand fast and fluent and idiomatic speakers. That's something you can definitely get your teeth into and help with. But it doesn't mean anything to say native speakers, in my opinion. Right, Gav, what about this one? If your student says, should I live in a native speaking country to improve my English? I don't think you need to live in a country where the first language is English. For example, you might go and stay with a host family abroad in the US or somewhere else and the family you're staying with may not speak English. That's not going to help improve your English. Yeah, so just going to the country does not necessarily mean you're going to learn the language. And I've had many students go to camps training where they're just with other people from their country and all they do is speak their language. So going to an English-speaking country, yeah, it's going to be good if you get out there and practice and listen and try and use your English. Again, going to an English-speaking country doesn't mean they speak the English you imagine they do. And this question, 
Do native speakers really use these phrases? Some of them do, maybe. Some of them don't. I mean, does everybody you know, Gav, speak the same way? Well, I'm not sure what a native English speaker is, M. Well, we've already said that's confusing anyway. But if you're saying, do all English speakers use these phrases, do they? If you put it back to the student and say, well, do all people in your country speak the same way? Is the answer yes or no? I'm guessing they don't. I'm guessing they don't. We've got regional differences. We've got some dialects. There are a few words and some accents that might change the way that we speak in both your language and in English. So don't expect a standard English. And my students love idioms. They want me to tell them all these idioms. I don't use that many idioms, but I know people who love idioms. They use them all the time. So it's not really a across the board thing. It's a very personal thing sometimes. Finally, Gav, if your student, and this is probably the one that we get the most, if your student said, can you help me speak like a native speaker? What would be your reaction? I will explain to the student that, of course, any qualified teacher from any country can teach them these skills we've described. Maybe the student wants to learn a British accent, a more American, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand accent, but their teacher cannot make them like a native. It just doesn't mean anything. How about you, Em? Yeah, I think it doesn't really exist in my head what that is, so I can't really teach someone to be that thing if I don't understand what that thing is. But I think I know what they mean. I think you've just got to, again, have a conversation. And what do they mean before we wrap this up? Well, like I said before about the understanding native speakers, I think they mean fluent, lots of idioms, phrasal verbs connected speech, those kind of things. And that's exactly what all teachers do. They teach these skills. Exactly. I think having a conversation about it, telling your student it's not only people from America, Canada, Australia, England who can speak this way. Of course, there are millions of people who can speak the way they are describing. So all these things aren't only done by people born in a specific English-speaking country. And I think your students need to be aware of that. And teachers too. Very well described. So what can we do, Em, to support our colleagues who might be affected by native speakerism? I think there are lots of things we can do, Gav. For starters, take native English speaker off of your CV, resume, off your Instagram profile, your LinkedIn profile, business cards, email signature, and also... Don't put a photo on your CV. Those are all very good suggestions. And there are some other ideas from tessel.org. They suggest making space for language varieties in your classroom. Expose your students to a range of different varieties of English so that they hear the rich variations in how English is used around the world. Good one. Also raise awareness about the issue. Talk to your students. Talk to your colleagues, your friends, your family. Find out their experiences. Let's not get complacent. Let's keep this topic relevant and current. If we keep talking about native speakerism, then perhaps we can eradicate it. That's true. We can also encourage colleagues to shift away from standard varieties to focus on achieving a high level of intelligibility. Instead, I often say to my students, focus on communication less on other things. Also, shift the focus among language teachers from nativeness to language proficiency and language teaching competence. These aspects are more helpful in thinking about one's identity as a language teacher. That is a good point, M. As you will find online, there are many grading charts that show the highest level, which they often refer to as native or near native. I find this very confusing because all of these levels have such a defined name. You know, you've got A1, B2, proficiency. They've all got these very clear goals and what you can do. And then suddenly you get to native and I feel like it's a very fuzzy definition. As Mary said, native could be a myriad of different abilities. So 
having the idea of the highest level of language as native, again, is very ambiguous, don't you think, Gav? Absolutely. And finally, review the policies at your institution. Does the recruitment process favour individuals from certain language varieties? Is there a difference in the pay scale between native speakers and non-native speakers? Does the hiring policy marginalise teachers for whom English is not their first language? Advocate for change. And get the conversation going. Ask your fellow teachers, ask your colleagues, what did you have to do in the interview? Did you take a test? Did you have to do a demo lesson? Make sure it's fair, that everybody's doing the same thing. And if it's not, then ask your managers why. Why not? And we did exactly that. We reached out to Charlotte at Charlotte Teaches English on Instagram and found out about her own experiences where she saw firsthand a co-worker getting paid a lot less money simply because they were not from an English-speaking country despite having master's degrees in linguistics. That is astounding. You will find these stories everywhere, Em, sadly. And if you have a story that you want to share with us, please feel free to reach out to us on our socials. We'd be very interested to know how it is in your school or your company and what your experiences are. Em, I think we've just got time for... Learn Learn a a word. word. (laughs) That wasn't even in time. Learn Learn a a word. word. Okay, today's learn a word, Gav, is the suffix ism. Em, that's not a word. I've already done suffixes. (laughs) <laughs> you have, Gav, I know you have, but this one is maybe an important one to focus on today. So, ism, the ending ism. What comes to mind, Gav, when you think of ism? Imperialism. <laughs> okay. Ism, according to Wikipedia, comes from the ancient Greek, through Latin and French, and means taking sides with or imitation of, and is often used to describe philosophies, theories, religions, social movements, artistic movements and behaviours, and is typically added to nouns. Such as spiritualism, socialism, magnetism, scepticism, altruism, criticism, baptism, journalism, and so on. But also, it can form a noun with the sense or belief in the superiority of one over another. Oh, not sure about that, Em. No, I'm not. So can you think of examples? Sexism. Racism. Native speakerism. Ageism. There's also heightism, which I haven't heard of, but sizeism. Those are all terrible isms, Em. And I think we need to get away from the bad isms, Gav. Let's try and... Find a place where the bad isms don't exist so we can live in a world with only nice isms. Well, that's a good word, isn't it? Nice ism. I like nice isms. I like that too. And in 2015, Merriam Webster Dictionary declared ism to be word of the year. So, Gav, what's your favourite ism? Happyism. You're an English teacher, Gav. Tell me a word that really exists. Euphemism. Can you give me a good example of a euphemism? Don't be a stranger, Em. See you, Gav. 